to say to you, I mean, if they're tackling that and they're doing something with you, they must be doing something. I think it's all. Perhaps not. Let me see if it's shown. Stand near the laptop. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right, cool. Hold on. We all in. We all in. Yeah. Yes, right. Yeah. 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 Ye
Then there's exogenous factors, same story, investors chase profits and profits are determined by increasing prices. But here prices are uh, determined by the area of reputation. So if the area of reputation goes up, prices are going to go up. If area of reputation goes down, prices are going down. They have a positive correlation. And the area of reputation itself is determined by various factors. Uh, these include uh, high crime. I would like to simplify this by uh, you know, thinking it as, as if you're going to move into the area. So as a first time buyer, if you go to this area, what are you going to be thinking? You're going to be thinking whether the crime rate is high. You're going to be thinking whether the amenities are close or far. You're going to be thinking whether the infrastructure is good, uh, whether you have good transport links, and whether there's general law and order. And you know, if an another area for the similar price of the house, they give all of these things to the to the buyer, they would go in and buy the house there. And when every buyer thinks like that, the price of the house comes down. So area reputation is very important, and we're going to be focusing on all of those exogenous factors to fix that. And because of this, demolition cost goes up. So if you leave this as it is, don't solve those things. Uh, demolition cost goes up, and then investment goes down, and the same story then continues to uh, a decay. So what what do you need to re regenerate? Since the problem is multidimensional, the solution should also be multidimensional. So maybe just providing social housing wouldn't fix the problem if other things remain the same. So, but social housing is important and we're going to be focusing on how you can get uh, social housing right in terms of its design. But since my research was more focused on how you can achieve the wider goal of economic prosperity and uh, Ross's research was more focused on the design, I'll skip that point so he can come back to it. Second is increasing housing supply in general. Uh, you know, if, you, if there are a lot of empty properties in the area and uh, uh, the surrounding residents know no one's living there uh, in terms of you know, empty lands even, empty properties, they then become safe havens for crime, fly tipping and all sorts of other things. So that's why you see these isolated areas uh, full of graffiti. Uh, uh, Ross is going to come to that point. Uh, but overall, that that deters buyers from coming to that area. So the best way to solve this quick problem is by getting those properties occupied, getting them in the market uh, supply. Well, how how can you do it? Well, you can use the simple rule of carrots and sticks. So uh, carrots being you can uh, offer grants or loans for the buy for the landlords and uh, and the property owners to release those lands. Or you can offer coercive measures, such as a vacant land tax, and that should make them to release those lands so that you can use it for your uh, regeneration program. But then what's more important is to examine the type of demand that you've got. So not just increasing housing supply, but also really knowing what, what's really needed in the area. So for example, uh, we, look, we looked in, the, in a case study of Northfield Village. They had lack of care homes with uh, unsweet bathrooms. Uh, after consultation with existing residents and looking at demographics, they then provided 80 extra care apartments for over 55 and a dementia care facility with 59 unsweet bathrooms. And the result of that was people were extremely satisfied and they hit the right aspect of the demand of the area. Uh, you can also provide a mix of tenures. You know, we said bad reputation leads to decay and a simple solution would be to stop that area from being categorized in a certain way, right? Uh, what, what can you do? There's a process called densification. So instead of providing one type of council housing, you can provide some expensive properties right next to a council house, right? Some student properties and just create a little mix so people don't categorize them into, you know, that's an Asian area or that's a white area or that's a student area because when they are able to categorize them, then some people might have positive things about the, those factors and some people might have negative things about those factors. Uh, one, one solution for student areas, uh, such as Bradford, 
is to merge two properties together and make one large property and one small property. So one would be, let's say, a three, four, five bedroom property and one would become a one bedroom property, for example. Uh, students like myself, uh, I lived in, I was tired of living in boarding school, sharing things, so I wanted to live alone when I came to university. So I rented a studio in uh, Nottingham to student accommodations and a lot of students like myself did the same. They went to these student accommodations and start living there. But what what did it do? It left a lot of vacant properties in in uh, Radford and Highsome Green. And uh, during our first uh, uh, meeting with Dan in the Rogue Landlords team, I'm sure most of you will know him, uh, he said that this is the prime reason for the issue of Rogue Landlord, which is very related to your program, not to together program. Uh, he said that because all of those uh, property owners bought the properties initially so they can put them for rent, so as an investment, so the properties pay for the mortgage themselves. When these students moved to these student accommodations, those properties were left empty and all of a sudden they needed to pay for their mortgages. What did they do? They gave their houses for cheaper uh, rents to people with uh, you know, bad backgrounds, criminals, or they broke the law themselves by not getting a license and giving the properties to a lot of people which led to overcrowding. And since these things are out of the uh, council site, uh, out of the law's reach, they then take advantage of it. You know, these landlords then uh, manipulate and, you know, take, uh, just, just don't treat the tenants well. So that whole issue of rogue landlord can be solved if these properties are converted into student properties, some of them, and those students are brought back to these house houses. Uh, ONS uh, mid-year estimates show that uh, Eberritum and St. Anne's had the greatest population increase uh, between 2014 and 2015 due to new student properties being built near Nottingham Trent University. So all of these students moved to those properties. And that led to a decline in uh, four wards, Burwell, Radford and Park, and Wollaston East and Lenton Abbey. So that really, I found the statistics in the morning uh, when I was traveling, so uh, this is a bit new in the thing. I also pulled some graphs up here uh, about the issue of um, uh, the categorization of areas. You can see that here, where is it? Dunkirk and Lenton's there. Wollaston, I like many points. Radford. Radford. Oh, there it is. That course, oh, there it is. Sure. Yeah, sorry about that. So Radford's there, and this blue uh, thing over here shows that they are Asians and Asian British, and the blue bars show that they are um, uh, uh, mixed, mixed and multi ethnic groups. So you can see by comparing to the Nottingham overall and England overall, this box over here is much bigger than this. So, since Radford is dominated by one ethnic group, a good way to solve the problem would be just, you know, densify it and bring other ethnicities together. And, you know, when a lot of races are going to live together, a lot of ethnic groups are going to live together, they might have, you know, better understanding of each other's values and stuff. And that might lead to a small, uh, a high decrease in uh, hate crime even. If you look at uh, the A structure, uh, for example, uh, Nottingham, actually has a very high increase in 20 to 24 years olds and uh, according to ONS Radford has the third largest student population of 48.6 percent which is after Lenton 56.5 percent and Dunkirk 55.1 percent so since it's such a dom student dominated area anyways it would be a good idea to have different uh, other age groups older families and uh, all sorts to come to the, these areas to densify it. Um, obviously, there are issues with this. I mean, not everyone wants to live next to a student house because we are party freaks. But <laughs> Ross is going to come to uh, different. Uh, he'll tell you about different solutions how you can sort that out. So, oh, 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 oh! Before I go to the next one, there's also <coughs> the problem of. 
uh, keeping existing residents in the in the accommodations. Yes, I said densifying is good. You can instead of building five council houses instead of five council houses, you can build two and three other properties. If that comes at, at the expense of existing residents, that's where a lot of regeneration programs have failed. So it's very very important that the existing residents stay in their properties. And if you have extra space, then you build these. Uh, properties by just el eliminating alleyways and other things. Uh, Russell, mm -hmm. uh, come to that. You can save a lot of space and build these housing, uh, extra houses. Uh, you know, Everfield Estate demolished two hundred ninety-seven units and built two and ten-story buildings uh, to make one thousand one hundred seventy-six residential units and also retail units and neighborhood center. So high rises did go out of popularity, but for some reason they are coming back into popularity and a lot of people want to live in these. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can increase the, st the number of stories to build these extra council houses or uh, private flats. Uh, Everfield Estate, by doing that, they saw the highest tenant satisfaction rate of 85% because they, sorry, they, they kept all of the existing properties there. Another point to keep in mind is parking. Uh, a lot of uh, regeneration programs, they assume that by increasing infrastructure and transport links, people are going to use that and they're not going to use many of the parking spaces. But uh, from a buyer's perspective, a buyer of a house, his perspective, think of it as the following. They might not use uh, cars for their daily use, but for Thanksgiving, for Christmas, for Eid, and all sorts of festivals, they might have friends and families coming over. Where are they going to park? So when they're buying their properties, they might be looking at those kind of things and seeing whether other areas are offering those solutions. So if you get rid of parking at the expense of uh, densification, then that might lead to some issues. Also, areas just generally already dense. You know, you can look at demographics for that to see how many properties are there per uh, section square meters to see what's the density rate. Uh, I couldn't do that yet for my report, uh, but I'm sure I'll be able to do it by January uh, since you guys needed the report a bit early. Uh, I had a lot of deadlines, so I couldn't cover that area, but I'm sure I found a couple of uh, statistics and uh, uh, the census was back in 2011, so that's a bit outdated. Uh, if I could get hold of better statistics, I would really appreciate it. But then I would be able to tell whether the area is already dense, but I'm sure you can also do that yourself. Uh, there's also the issue of transport and infrastructure. Uh, there's a, without transport, investors have to rely on each other's decisions, right? And what do I mean by that? There's been a study by the Department of Transport and they said that increasing investment in infrastructure has speculative effects. Normally, uh, if it's me and Ross as investors, for example, I wouldn't invest in the area if, I'd, if I'm not sure that Ross would also invest. Let's say there are two invest, investors in the area. So if all the investors collectively invest, only then the prices are going to go up and they're going to receive their returns. But then there's this prisoner's dilemma. I don't know if Ross will do it. And if I do it and Ross doesn't do it, I lose out because the prices aren't, aren't going to increase. And Ross is probably going to think the same thing about me. Investment in transport has a positive effect because investment in transport itself has uh, increases expectations of prices to increase. So then Ross and I would not have to rely on each other's decisions for the prices to increase. We already know that prices are going to increase. So I can go and invest even if Ross doesn't invest. And if that happens, if you invest in uh, transportation and uh, infrastructure, then all of these investors are going to start investing into the area and there's going to be this economic activity going on again. Uh, in Aberfeld Estate, I love that state. It's in East London, by the way. Uh, it installed two pedestrian crossings and uh, before that, the area was very isolated, but but just incre but just installing two pedestrian crossings, which connected them to a train station, I believe. Uh, property owners who bought the properties in the area, they saw price increases before they even moved into the property, and there was this huge article on uh, uh, Metro, I think, uh, 
they bragged about all of this price increase in the area and that itself when other people found out that prices are increasing so quickly they started buying it and that further multiplied the process in general just investing in infrastructure and transport would ease things for parents and children children can go to their schools early and parents can go to their workplaces uh, one other thing I kind of found was um, if you connect uh, your decaying area to the previously regenerated area. If you connect them with transportation links, for example, if someone was thinking of opening an office in uh, central Nottingham, well, because the transportation links are so good with Heisen Green, if they are if they are so good, he would be thinking, I can just open it for cheaper in Heisen Green, and all of my customers can just use the tram link, you know, to come to Heisen Green. So you can actually have some of that spill out from those regen previously regenerated areas to your regenerated areas and once you regenerate Heisen Green and Radford you can do the same thing for other ones so transportation should not be uh, underestimated in any way then there's uh, employment and um, enterprise uh, you know job creation is almost inevitable with every regeneration program but what's important is to localize the gains uh, if, if all of the important jobs are taken by the local people you would see a greater increase in uh, the benefits from your uh, regeneration program. Uh, there was a case of Northfield Village. Uh, they created 198 jobs and 10 apprenticeships, all taken by the local people. So that's something that was very impressive. You can also have certain policies, and that's when I come back to uh, forming of these um, uh, uh, joint ventures with all of these other companies when you do start the project. It would be a good idea to have a policy uh, there was Enfield's regeneration company, Your Housing. They said they decided that they're going to purchase all of their materials within the 10 mile radius. Anything they find cheaper out of that 10 mile radius, they're not going to buy it, okay, even if it's cheaper. So, what that would do is uh, when you buy it from someone in the local area, he would see an increase in income and he would go and spend in other areas of your uh, other shops and businesses in your area and they're going to see an increase in income and because of that increase in income they're going to go spend and you know that would multiply all of this uh, effect. Uh, households have also started to like the use of air rights as I said uh, where housing is provided above amenities in the supermarkets. I actually have a picture here. Mm, this is uh, a building, a fairly new building where I live in London, Hounslow. Uh, what they did is they provided all of these apartments on top. A uh, couple of, uh, uh, there were a couple of office uh, offices for commercial people on the side. And they had council housing on some of these flats as well. They also have, I don't know if you can see it or not, there's a gym over here, there's Asda Superstore, there's a clothing store there. If all of these amenities are just below you, people are going to get attracted. Uh, there's also parking there, and there was underground parking underneath that as well. So that would be a very cost-effective way of uh, doing this. With rising population and changing needs of households, uh, this might be a more sustainable option. And in fact, even when planning and designing the project, you might want to consider the long-term implications of the project. Uh, if your project, if the, if the regeneration only benefits people for the next 20 years, it might not be worth it. You know, if you, if you look ahead like 50, 60 years, then that would be something uh, good to do. A lot of regeneration programs actually failed because of that, because they were very short-sighted in terms of their planning. Uh, Everfeld Estate spent 250 million on something like this. They uh, built a community center to engage more people together, a faith building, healthcare, mix of commercial premises. Uh, Enfield Liverpool, they uh, invested in a, uh, an area of commercial offices and they actually went one step further, they invested in a hotel as well. Now that's a bit of an odd uh, uh, mix of things to invest in, but what they, did, what they had in mind was office workers are going to use a hotel for uh, their training and other events and tourists are also going to come because of that cheap hotel provision. And since these office workers also find that convenient, all of these cafes and restaurants started to come in, start, start, started to come to this 
to the area to uh, serve the needs of these new influx of office workers. And all of a sudden you had this economic activity going on, more job creation, and because of all of this business activity, prices are going to go up, right? And uh, you, yes, the areas decayed because of lack of uh, uh, market, there was a market failure, but you don't want the market failure to reoccur. You want to do something so the area then fixes itself and starts regenerating itself so you don't have to go and have another regeneration program in 50 or 60 years. By doing something like that, you're bringing all of these businesses in and all of these, this investment is going to come in. If prices go up in the area, you're sorted. You don't have to go and regenerate the area anytime soon. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so you can also uh, look at the fact that all of these new properties are going to be airtight. Uh, with improved insulation, uh, you're going to reduce cost of living and uh, because of that, you can uh, eradicate prop poverty. That's another wider economic goal that you can focus on. Uh, North Prospect, Plymouth, they've reduced their bills by a third. And that attracted many first-time buyers, because first-time buyers, you've got to think, they can barely uh, afford their mortgages. When we graduate, we're going to get our house. We don't want to pay high bills on top of all of the mortgage expenses that we're going to be paying. So that's something that you can look at. Uh, it also supported 500 jobs and 30 placements for trainees and apprenticeships. Increase in employment is all good, but you've got to keep in mind that this does not drive up inflation during the process, because if unemployment is going down all of a sudden, you're creating a shortage in the labor market, the wage rates are going to go up. So if people start demanding higher wages, that's going to be a cost to your uh, project. And something like this should be taken into account for the, uh, the costing of the project when you, you design your feasibility reports. Uh, yeah, that would be it for this one. And now it's the design bit. I've talked for a while, so I'll give it to <laughs> Ross to do this. Okay, so before I get into design, uh, probably the first thing is pretty important. So this is the pie chart of the crime breakdown of the Radford Hodge and Green area for pretty much the past year. And you can see a lot of the crimes here could be presentable, uh, preventable. So obviously over a quarter of it is antisocial behaviour, which is just there. The next biggest uh, segment of it is violent crime, which can be prevented. prevented. And a lot of other crimes here as well are quite small petty crimes. So you've got burglary, robbery, shoplifting, bike theft, all of these sort of things which you're probably going to get in an area which has seen a lot of decay over the years and generations brought through it. So I'm going to talk about eight different ways that design can reduce crime and promote a stronger community cohesion. Uh, all of these come from research and are backed up by cases. I don't talk about so many, but it's included in my report anyway, four cases. So the first one is natural surveillance, which is the idea that you can build up buildings and uh, plan towns in a way that enables crime to be prevented by creating a scenario where potential criminals feel like they're always going to be watched. So if you look at that picture there, the odds of someone committing a crime there are likely going to be reduced because of the, build, the way that this building in the front garden is laid out there it creates a scenario that I feel like they're always going to be watched. So as the arrows say there, the windows at the top obviously is observation. People could be up there and they can look down. If you've got terrace housing there and the front garden, it's likely there's going to be neighbours who know each other that could be out the front talking. You've got porches there as well, where and front rooms there where the lights could be on. And all of that, if you're out there, creates an environment where sort of light beams down and you know that you can be seen. So the odds of you committing a crime or any sort of antisocial behaviour can be reduced because you think that you're being watched by someone. Uh, Second point is about access control, which is the idea that places with well-defined routes, spaces and entrances uh, provide for convenient movement without compromising any security. And it means that collectively it creates an environment which defers crime. Uh, so as you can see there, which is a past regeneration scheme, I can't remember where the image is from exactly, but that was the original and that was what they did after. Obviously, if you look there, that is sort of 
that's obviously a lot more built up than that. You have, there's a clear line of sight and you can see straight down. There's nothing blocking it in the way. There's no fence. That, obviously, that looks quite decayed and run down compared to that, so that helps as well. But that's there's fence in there and there's a gate there. If there was any sort of small crime, say if it was a drug deal or something like that, then that could happen behind there in this outer line of sight from the public and pedestrians that are there. Whereas that, there's a clear line of sight. It's more likely because obviously there's houses there. So there's going to be pedestrians walking up and down and if there's anyone there then they can see the people in front rather than there when you've got ways you could hide behind and you've got things you can do you won't be seen. Uh, the third point is about image maintenance which is the idea that if you're going to regenerate an area you need to sort of by using by building and regenerating all of it you create an environment where people can take pride in their area and where they're from. Uh, there's a theory called the broken window theory which sort of says that uh, Say if you've got graffiti and you have one piece of graffiti on the wall and then you just don't do anything about it, you leave it to build up, then the likelihood is there's going to be more people attracted to it, there's going to be more and more graffiti, as you can see in this picture there. Obviously the area is decaying, as you can see the brickwork there has sort of fell off and it's been left sort of to rot. And there's obviously a lot of graffiti there, but could you imagine if there was one small piece of graffiti, like that tag there, and someone was sent out after it was noticed and it was cleared up? The likelihood is the rest of that wouldn't have happened. There wouldn't have been all of that graffiti allowed to collect there. Obviously it looks bad, it doesn't look like an area which sort of has a lot of pride in itself, it hasn't got a lot of self-esteem. The other obvious one is litter. If you leave litter to just sort of build up and there's no one out there monitoring it, then the likelihood is that people are going to litter more and the problem's going to get worse and worse. And collectively, you're creating a situation where people sort of they don't take any pride in the area because they've got no reason to. It's not a nice, nice looking area, it's not well looked after and it just invites sort of petty crimes like this and just continue and just build up from each other. Uh, next point is tenant satisfaction. It's the idea that alongside sort of the image and the reputation of the area that you can do the same with housing. So you need to, if you're going to regenerate social housing or seek to attract investors into an area, they're going to provide adequate housing which people like. It's obviously going to have to be better than what they had before. The housing where they just prefer living there and it gives them more of a reason like the housing and the area that it's in to take pride in the area and to in, sort of appreciate the fact that they live in that area and it's better than what was once there. Obviously you've got that collectively it all creates an idea where it reduces crime so, somewhere in there. But yeah, collectively, you've got more pride in the area. You're not going to go out committing sort of petty crimes, doing graffiti, being antisocial because you've got a reason to have pride in the area. Uh, activity sport is quite a basic idea. It's encouraging by building things like, say, you know, like little football cages with the basketball hoops in. It encourages sport. Uh, more restaurants and more cafes. It creates an environment where there's a lot of <coughs> things to do. It's distracting people from going. That people aren't going to be bored because there's options there for things to do. So you're not going to be as inclined to go out committing small crimes and doing things like that because there's more things to do. It serves another function as well, as you can see for that picture there, it's quite a nice looking area, it's quite a nice restaurant, but the main emphasis there is outdoor seating. Now, like I pointed out with natural surveillance in the first photo that was there, the odds of someone committing a crime or say if it was graffiti or a mugging or something like that, it's probably not going to happen somewhere like that in front because it creates the same thing where there's eyes on the street. So you're going to feel like if you were to do something there, then you're going to be being watched by someone, someone might notice it. And the odds of you being reported are obviously going to go up, you're going to be found out. So you're going to be less inclined in a situa like, situation like that to commit a crime because you're also going to feel like you're being watched. Uh, the next one's health and education. Housing, health and education are all intrinsically linked in a way that how if you have a building and property that someone lives which has got double glazing, it's well insulated. The odds of it developing mould and being damp, having better air quality, having no damage to your lungs, which is a result of all of that, it's all reduced. So if you look at that picture there, it's not very nice, is it? It's not what you want to live in and no one wants to live in that. But the reality is that that's going to come because the house that they're living in is damp, it's not properly insulated, it's probably single glazing, it's not double glazed. So that can have the effect that it can, things like fever can come as a result of living in an area of poor air quality. Another thing as well with the link to employment is if you're off ill, say if it's developed, say if you get an illness which is caused by that, then obviously you're going to be off ill. But at the same time, if you have another illness, 
the odds of you recovering at a quicker rate are sort of reduced. So if you're living in an environment where the air quality is poor and it's damp and you're trying to recover from an illness, it's probably going to take a bit longer to do it. So that has that effect on poor them. Uh, there's also a strong link between that and education. There was a report which Sultan looked at and there was a woman in the recent study was saying that once her housing regime had regenerated and she moved into a better house and she said that her daughter was getting on much better with her schoolwork because every winter before she would get tonsillitis because she's living in the environment they were living in and because they moved into this better area she's been much healthier and more able to focus on the school work. School work. Uh, the other thing as well is if you build up new properties, you have to ensure that in living rooms, bedrooms, places where people are going to be living, that you have space where education is encouraged. So that would be by not overcrowding and ensure that there's space in the room for the actual layout of the room where you could encourage something like a desk to be there. Because obviously if there's no, if, if you've got a property where there's no space, there's no desk, there's no room for anyone to do work, then it's not going to encourage someone to do their homework if they're a young person. So I'm going to encourage someone to do any studying or if they work from home, that could be hindered as well. So you have to take into consideration that the odds of someone doing better at school are going to be substantially increased if they live in live in a house or a flat where they've got space they can sit peacefully and do their work. It's not overcrowded and the space is there to do it. Target hardening is another one. It's quite a basic idea that if you make crimes more difficult to commit, less crimes are going to happen. So. If you look there, the two obvious ones, CCTV in operation, obviously having CCTV there, especially having those signs up around everywhere to let people know. The odds of someone committing something like trying to commit a burglary or doing graffiti or something like that, is gonna be significantly reduced because they feel like natural surveillance that someone watching them and if the crime gets reported, they can look at CCTV and they can get found out because of it. Another one there is her. That door is obviously quite a good lock system. The odds of someone breaking into the property that's got that lock in it is significantly reduced because how are you going to get through that, really? Uh, other ways you do that, uh, obviously having heavier doors, uh, CCTV, locks, landscaping and fencing and building it in a way so if you've got a gate, like a heavy duty gate, it's a lot harder to get into it. High fencing means that you, you, know, you can't just hop a fence to get into a house because you're not going to be able to get over it as easy as you would before. So all little things like that together sort of acts as a way of preventing crime purely just because it's harder to actually commit the crime in the first place. The last point is about territoriality. It's about public and private space and making sure there's a big distinction between them. There's two reasons why this has an effect on crime. The first reason is because a property such as this one here, you may be more, if, if you want to burgle that property, it's not like high rise flats where it's just one then the other then the other. You may feel like it's a lot more difficult to get in that. And the fact that there's a clear distinction between what's public property and what's private property is more defined. And that could off put someone from committing burglary there as well. The other thing as well is you've got a community where everyone's living like this and you have, you have, you sort of have a feel like you can have a sense of pride and ownership of what is your property and what someone else would. So subconsciously, you will have a respect for someone else because in their property because you feel that that's their property and that is the public space and you shouldn't intrude on that. Compared to like a high-rise flat where it's all community and it's all built up and there's one then the other then the other, then there's not the same sense of what is yours and what is theirs. So you may be more likely to commit like burglary or something like that in that area because you don't distinct that from the public property. You don't distinct make a distinction between that and what is public land as much as you would between public land being there and what's obviously in someone's property there. You can do that obviously the way that that's set up there. You've got the property there which then lowers down into a path which is in line with public property. You've then got a front garden which is someone else that someone can own. If you're somebody who likes gardening then that's yours and it's your land as well. Then you've got a fence which sort of re further reinforces that that's someone's land. And then in front of that you've got plants all there and then fences there which are in line, uh, hedges there which are in line with the fence which all collectively reinforce the idea that that is someone's property which should be respected and that is the public land which is where you're allowed to be. So the question now is should you refurbish houses, build new ones or demolish and build, uh, rebuild? And uh, uh, I looked up uh, a uh, paper by Patterson and others in 2016 and they uh, mentioned, they, they measured the, the cost and benefit ratios of different uh, strategies uh, based on the 2010 figures but they although the figures are quite old they said that 
they, they've proven by some measure that they are quite reliable figures even for 2017, 2016, sorry. Uh, so they found a cost and benefit ratio of 1.3 for refurbishing houses. Building new ones, they said it's 1.7. And finally, for demolishing and rebuild, it's 3.7. So clearly, building, uh, rebuilding housing is the best way forward. Uh, however, uh, this might not always be the case, but uh, it, properties that have reached the end of their expected life cycle, uh, for example, in uh, North Prospect, 60% of the stock failed their decent homes standard. And for those, obviously refurbishing and build, building new wouldn't be a better option. It would be a better thing to do to just demolish and rebuild uh, because in 10 or 15 years time, those, you're gonna have the cost of maintaining those properties is going to go up. Uh, a good way to figure out which option you need for uh, different properties is to conduct house surveys. Uh, so someone can just go and value the cost of refurbishments and then based on that you can make your decisions. And you can also look at uh, uh, opinions of existing residents and uh, look at population forecasts. Uh, both of them can identify any potential long-term shortages. So if a house uh, is a three bedroom and uh, uh, the population forecast says that the population is going to multiply by three times in the next 10, uh, 10 years, then building a new one to accommodate those would be a better option. Who should lead on delivering this regeneration activity? Well, the obvious one is the council. Nottingham City Council has all of the uh, access to planning systems for land allocations. So based on that strength, it would be best for Nottingham City Council to lead. However, that, that doesn't mean that other uh, stakeholders should be ignored. Housing companies uh, and housing associations, this isn't in the report, so that's something new. Uh, I found that there's a housing company called Nottingham City Homes uh, and two housing associations, Hampton Housing Association and Nottingham Community Housing Associations. They do uh, yearly surveys and research into uh, uh, residents' needs, so they know the markets very well. And even afterwards, with the process of densification, I said you can sell the properties they would be a good option for you to sell the properties at the right values because of the extensive research. And you can also look at National Federation of uh, Arms Length Man Management Organizations. They have funding as well. And most of all, the residents, you want to keep their smiles high up and the flags waving. So they are the most important. How do you finance regeneration? The initial phase is the hardest. Uh, for every regeneration project uh, because stakeholders are reluctant they don't believe in your project they might have they might be pessimistic uh, which is fair because at the very start you have very large expenditure and you don't have any revenue coming in uh, you might have to uh, uh, provide accommodations for people who you're going to be moving around mm -hmm. and with no you know revenue coming in they would be reluctant to invest there's also the difficulty of releasing lands from the leaseholders. Uh, they might not be prepared to release it at the values that you might propose. And uh, the general conclusion with this one is, <coughs> you know, the greater the number of leaseholders, the more difficulties you're going to have. So having those low would be a good thing for you. <laughs> uh, uh, for Aberfeld Estate regeneration, they encountered various problems with regards to leaseholders especially. So, I have attached the case studies in my email, so it would be a good idea to look at them uh, for further details. Solution. If you have a robust funding plan and you convince the uh, stakeholders, then they are likely to be optimistic. Okay. Uh, but then, also, uh, with having a robust plan, you can apply for funding schemes, and that can uh, help you go through the initial phase. But there's a problem with those market changes. If interest rate fluctuate, mortgage rates fluctuate, then you would have uh, those funding schemes can be withdrawn because they're not contracted usually. And uh, uh, fiscal policy changes, if suddenly Labour comes into power and they decide regeneration is not for Nottingham, then you'll have an issue there. They might not give you enough funding for such programs. So fiscal changes are important as well. One solution, if uh, you have serious uh, uh, funding problems, 
land. Nottingham Council, councils in general have a lot of access to land and uh, there was a there was a, a pilot done by Sir, uh, Sheffield Housing Company, SHC, and they basically designed a model where the council can provide land as their 50% investment, and the housing company can then match the value of the land to invest uh, on top. And that can basically reduce your investment to uh, almost close to zero. Uh, restriction, you cannot do uh, 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 refurbishments or demolish and rebuild. So those who cost and benefit ratios are going to be gone. You can because it's vacant land. You can only rebuild on it. So the option of refurbishments and others they go off the table. And if the price of lands are very low, which is usually the case with decaying areas, then your invest your side of the investment might not be able to match with their side of the investment. So you might have to. Uh, match up with further investments. However, uh, later phase is not as difficult because you have properties ready to sell, uh, the medium stage and the later stage. Usually these regeneration projects from my research, they last for 10 to 15 years. So the initial phase is usually two or three years and by three years time you have a lot of properties ready for sale. Uh, Everfield Estate put 982 units for private sale. There's a problem with this however, uh, the Sheffield Housing Company, they undervalued their properties by more than £15,000 per unit. So they were making, they were losing money with every plot they sold. Uh, a good solution would be to work closely with values. That's where the uh, housing companies and housing associations can be very useful. Uh, they, they, you can get them to do uh, an early uh, valuation of the project. Because with this regeneration activity, we said that it has very a lot of multiplier effects, and you might think the prices are not going to rise to a certain level as much, but the prices of the area might rise a lot more. So undervaluing the properties might undermine this advantage of selling properties. Uh, some parts of the areas might generally be unviable, even within the area. Some. Uh, some sites would be unviable and others would be more profitable. An advantage in this state could be uh, for you to use the surpluses in some uh, parts of the areas and uh, cover the cost of the others. Uh, however, if you have any issues with uh, such surpluses, surpluses not being large enough, uh, you can always go to the government for grants. Uh, North Prospect did this. They, the issue they faced was uh, they couldn't sell their new builds in the open market because that wouldn't have regenerate, uh, generated enough revenues for them uh, and cover the cost of lands and the building costs. Uh, and with the quality of their existing stocks very low, they couldn't refurbish as well. So that was out there. The, that was not an option for them. They had to go and get uh, funding through grants and. That's how they uh, got positive values on the books. You can also offer government loan. Uh, EIB is a good option, uh, invest, uh, European Investment Bank, that is. Uh, large organizations are normally able to get a loan uh, from these uh, type of institutions. Uh, they can borrow directly. A uh, large organization would be possible. I forgot to mention, with having all of these housing companies and our housing associations, you're likely to encounter a problem where they are going to conflict with each other. They might have different approaches and you don't want them to fight with each other. Uh, and a simple solution with that would be to establish a local housing company. So having all of these stakeholders in a, in a single organization under a single name and all of them having different roles and responsibilities so they know what they're doing. Uh, an establishment of such a joint venture would make you a large enough organization to go to EIB and get their funding. Uh, they also provide funding on uh, uh, loans on very cheap terms. And finally, you have the option of low cost refurbishments. Uh, I did say refurbishments have the lowest cost and benefit ratios, but uh, they should not be underestimated because merely just providing loft insulation and cladding external walls with insulating panels. Uh, 
they drastically improved efficiency of certain properties. Uh, in North Prospect, for example, they replaced the roofs, the doors, and the windows of 302 of their properties. And because they increased the efficiency of these properties, uh, it allowed them to gain 750,000 pounds from the Community Energy Saving Program. So something like that you can use uh, for properties that are not too outdated. Uh, they're fairly, uh, fairly up to date and in good conditions. You can use furbishments to bring them to the right level. Conclusion? Very good. So yeah, to conclude, uh, given the multi-dimensional nature of the cause of decay, uh, to make regeneration successful in the area, is every measure should be taken to increase the attractiveness of red and the height and green to investors. Uh, every measure should be taken to increase the supply of high quality housing, of which much should be affordable housing sold at 8% of the market rate, uh, through ways not just exclusive to simply building new housing. Uh, housing is the most important aspect of social regeneration, of course, but if other areas such as infrastructure, law and order, education, employment options, all of these things are unaddressed as well, then the long term reality is and the area is likely to slip back into decay again and it will need further investment in the future. Identification obviously has its benefits as Sultan explained, but if not carefully planned it can result in overcrowding and then further dissatisfaction, further decay in the area and residents won't be happy about it. So, Projects in the past have failed largely because of that and they haven't taken into consideration the effects of just gentrifying and putting or building up an area so much, the long term effects of that. Uh, many reports have looked at the outcome benefits but regeneration may have many process benefits as well, such as improving partnership uh, working, increased community engagement and community cohesion. Improving in infrastructure and housing quality as well. Uh, alongside the creation of new jobs and apprenticeships for people in the local area and making sure that those new jobs and apprenticeships are accessible to people in that area uh, is just another mean of reducing poverty and raising the quality of living for everyone who lives in the area so the odds of it decaying again in the future are further reduced. Uh, lessons from the case studies discussed here and in reports include the importance, the importance of local residents uh, <coughs> yeah, less yeah. of the case of these important to local residents uh, to contact and involve a range of stakeholders so you can drag them all in so that it's not just one organisation being in control of the whole thing and not taking into consideration what the residents want. It needs to be a community, it needs to be a community regeneration scheme where all of the associations and organisations involved work closely with residents to see what they want to get out of it and so they can maximise their benefit of a regeneration scheme. Uh, nonetheless, there's always uncertainty due to markets, as Sultan has explained. They could be volatile at times and anything could happen in the future which may put the regeneration scheme at risk. But with careful planning and accessing other sources of finance, successful regeneration scheme in the area, taking all that into consideration is completely plausible. Uh, I was talking to my high school teacher on my way here and, uh, to the council in the morning and I explained to him about this whole project and what my findings were. And he suggested that I should look at Iceland's uh, model for tackling youth crime because I told, told him about Helsinki and Radford and how these areas are. And he said from the sounds of it you should really look at Iceland's uh, a way of doing it and I actually haven't researched on that so that would be something I would be able to research in the next uh, two or three weeks. Uh, also he mentioned Shoresart and that didn't occur to me at all. Uh, it was a uh, it was an area-based initiative announced in 1998 by Chancellor of the Exchequer Gordon Brown. Um, having done some research in the morning, uh, the aim of it was to give children the best possible start of life. Uh, this was important. This is very relevant to us because uh, child poverty is quite high. Uh, from the, from vaguely browsing through the uh, census of 2011. Uh, so improvement, improvement in childcare and early education, health and family support would fix those uh, uh, areas of the of the area, fix those areas, uh, child child poverty. Uh, however, cuts under coalition government, they stopped many of these uh, these organisations and they devolved more powers to the council. So if the councils wanted to do this they could do it. Uh, I found uh, an article on BBC 
where children's minister Sarah Fletcher, she says that there was enough money av available to maintain existing children's centres, so if the councils wish to do it, they can do it. And the council, I, I, I you might know more about this than me. Uh, I think there, there's always uh, there's already a lot of involvement of the council in Nottingham's uh, short staff. It's called Nottinghamshire Children and Families Partnership. And uh, but but then I just ha had a little uh, search on Google Maps to see where these organisations are, and the closest one I could find was uh, quite far from Heysen Green. Or Heysen Green's around there. It was in the Meadows. Uh, there are not many in the Nottingham, so that might be a good idea to have. Uh, it might be a good idea to have one of these organisations established in inside uh, Heysen Green or Radford. Uh, what what I found was uh, since Nottingham Council has a lot of influence in these uh, projects, since you are dealing with child poverty in one way or another, you might be able to access some of their funding. So that would be a good option. Also, I forgot to mention. Um, uh, in the healthcare provision, uh, some of my case studies gained funding from NHS uh, by providing for uh, people, ca people care for people with dementia and uh, the older population. So, if you are able to provide those kind of specific demands, address those specific demands, you might be able to get some of the funding from NHS as well. Uh, that would be all. Thank you. Well, uh, and we'll be ha happy to take some questions. Yeah, okay, questions. okay. I'm really sorry because I'm going to have to shoot off in in uh, oh in 15 minutes. But let me just uh, that was really good. It was a really good presentation. Very thorough uh, and very very broad. And if I could just say a few things, and if people want to to come in there. So as you as you see as you can see, uh, regeneration is a very complex yeah. complex area, and there's lots of things. And then we have done quite a lot of regeneration. In Nottingham, in in the past, uh, and where we've had government grants to be able to do to do that, uh, and to do it properly, it it, it really needs a, a whole lot of thinking through. And you're absolutely right about local residents having people being consulted about what they want to see, people that live in the area, and people that use the area, uh, but also having a number of stakeholders in. Just one organisation can't do it do it. Uh, do it on their own and it's interesting about you talked about transport and infrastructure of course one of the reasons that in Nottingham we've developed the tram is precisely because of that uh, and and making that and we what we found is what when we were developing the tram in various parts of Nottingham it's difficult uh, but actually the economic benefits uh, are, are and people being able to travel around in a cleaner city and uh, Sorry to interrupt you. I am actually a frequent uh, user of the tram, yes. and Heysen Green. I shop a lot from there as well, yes. uh, from Asda and uh, the Street and Sons for my Asian spices and everything. Yeah, and I yeah. would really appreciate if there's a better tram link between Dunkirk and there. <laughs> 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 so it's easier. So I don't have to drive there every time I go. <laughs> yeah, um, and I'm sure many other people are thinking the same thing. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm not. Uh, I, I think. I think. Uh, I think the next line will be will be out towards Derbyshire. But anyway, is there uh, not one by the outside? Because really? I, I don't know this at all, but that would just be a good idea. There's one by the beach, the Tesco and beach, there's yeah. no, yes. the tram lift there. Yes, yes. Which means I can get off, walk around a quarter of a mile, so it takes you straight down yes. to the Tesco. Yeah. So no, it's, it's, it is good. Uh, just in terms of the stuff that you were talking about, you know, the target hardening and mm. uh, and having defensible space and that sort of thing, I thought that was really, really interesting around how people feel and it's about people need to feel safe and one of the reasons that we've got community protection in Nottingham in the way that we have is precisely because of that recognition of the impact of the broken windows effect. Mm. Uh, so low level environmental crime, which is what a lot of our CPOs tackle, uh, the antisocial behaviour, the graffiti, the, the aggressive begging, that sort of thing, if you don't tackle those the rest will it will get much worse and you are absolutely spot on uh, about tagging of graffiti and what happens if you don't fix that uh, and that's uh, that's always worth worth bearing in mind uh, and the bit about student accommodation thought was interesting because one of the reasons we've got quite a lot of built student accommodation in Nottingham is because there was a recognition that houses were becoming people were buying up houses to use them for student accommodation which was causing problems in some areas. So it was about getting some of that choice back 
uh, and trying to bring some of those houses back into family use as well. Because what we were seeing in areas like Lenton was we were closing schools and other facilities because we didn't have the numbers because the student population was going up. That things like libraries and primary schools particularly having to justify keeping those open when there weren't the numbers there. So part of that policy has been to try and diversify, as you were rightly saying, some of the impacts that the larger number of students uh, were having on, on neighbourhoods in our city. So uh, anyway, that's that's I've got a couple of other things, but I don't know. No, I mean, I, I think that's some of the points are well made about the over-travel that's in our street of uh, Generation has come to place. That's certainly something that we saw uh, in terms of the development of student accommodation. And again, you remember this from the house and heydays was we all of a sudden had landlords that were prepared to rent to people who we were dealing with who were becoming homeless or threatened homelessness um, because previously they'd been an attractive proposition, and of course, they didn't want rent properties. So, we did have a very big problem with that during the time to say um, when, when that was a thing. We were able to get people into that accommodation that wasn't suitable and that it, it wasn't homeless. Um, yeah, because we had things like Article 4 coming so that people had yeah. to apply for planning permission to change the use of their property. It previously used to be if you had a property and you were going to make it a seven bed um, shared house or more, you had to apply for planning. But under Article 4, if you're changing it from a family property to any size shared property, you have to get planning permission and they're quite reluctant to give that. And I think that's. <coughs> areas becoming purely student areas and those sort of problems. And that and that is interesting in itself because when Article 4 came in, which we had to fight for to get, <coughs> um, what, had, what had happened in those areas, and it was that, that bit that you were saying about the multiplier effect, the, the houses became much more expensive because there was much more competition, people were buying them because they could change them into the seven bed units to students and the return was greater. Once Article 4 came in, the house prices, which had been artificially inflated in those areas, dropped. So actually, what then happened was a number of people that had been living there who then tried to buy their, uh, sell their properties and had previously been able to you know, get a third or more, more uh, it, that dropped and we had some unhappy people, some of which had been campaigning about the student studentification of the area, but then couldn't sell their properties at an inflated price, but were really sort of so that that whole thing's interesting to 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 yeah. watch some of those those other impacts of, of some of the actions that you take. We've also got the thing about uh, university credit and how that's going to impact as well. Do landlords can be prepared to get lets to when that really starts to bite, because quite plainly, um, in a lot of cases, people will not understand that particularly well, and they will be seen as too high risk for landlords. So we, again, we could have problems with those properties, um, people, you know, landlords wanting to exit the market, and that obviously create, creates problems around um, the, the effects of uh, landlords and so on. I thought the other thing, I mean, I think this was actually in your, Report was I, I, I'm not sure I've got a copy of your report. I thought if, oh, if you could let, let, let me have that yeah. because. Yeah. Um, the use of the allocation process as a means of managing behaviour and how the authority has tried to do that through a particular restrictive allocation process um, and how that's, that's been questionable as to how well that's worked. Um, because you, you now have a situation where anybody who's a private tenant is actually excluded from. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, from, from trying to, to get into safety and housing. Yeah. Whilst at the other end, we have people wanting to use the emergency remedies to access social housing with one eye on uh, the potential of multiplier as well. So it creates a, a number of um, problems for us. I mean, yeah. so, yeah. I'm really sorry I've got to dash off, but really, thanks very much. I was re really impressed. Were you? Did you enjoy doing it? Yeah, it was all right. Yeah. yeah. It was good. Yeah. Yeah. Enjoyed it. Yeah. You learn a lot when you do something like that. Like, it's how I did a lot on the design, but you don't realise, like, just little things like the access control and just making a nice walkway. Yes. Like, it does have effects. I you suppose that you've got a really good grasp of that. It's, yes. It's yeah. definitely the, 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 the stuff at the beginning is really fascinating, too. It's not the stuff that I've been sort of perhaps thinking about before, but definitely that 
issue of um, entry by intruders is something that I mean we, we had a, in, in environmental health in safer housing we had a, a dedicated worker who focused on entry by intruders especially in areas like London um, and the London Triangle because obviously student properties are so much more at risk because yeah. some of they know they can break into one property and get five laptops and five phones and five TVs and um, and there was a real focus on that in terms of lighting. In fact, I managed to get my landlord to do a lot of work to my property by being like, hey, I work for uh, environmental health and this is an issue around entry by intruders. So, so, but, 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 but again, you know, it's that whole thing that you've got to think things through. So when I was an area coordinator some years ago, I did gating schemes in Lenton, Snenton and Forest Fields. You know, the uh, on alleyways, gate, gating alleyway, uh, with a wall time fences uh, and that was that was to that was with a sort of crime hat on because what was happening people were being burgled by people just nipping around the back of the alley around the back of the house into the house so it was that opportunist burglary by putting the gates up on alleyways which we did that stopped i think the i can't remember what the stats were but they went down massively because people couldn't just nip round and get in through a back window what did happen was that people stopped, sort of started losing keys to the gates, all sorts of things. So rubbish was piling up in the, in the alleyways. Yeah, Our bin men couldn't get round. Who's responsible for if people have lost the keys, getting a new one? So, so there were, there were difficulties, uh, but actually the reason for doing them was because of the crime rates, and they they just dropped through the floor. So, so it's you know it is. Find a balance with it's a balance, step, yeah. Step, yeah. It? But thanks, that's really, really good. Really, in, really enjoyed Some it. Of your comments have actually helped me a lot now because I'm writing this report for my university project yeah. as well. So I'll consider some of those up. Yes. Well, these are, I mean, these are two, I mean, been through it in detail. I mean, they are two distinct pieces of work that do blend together very nicely, actually. Yeah, so I was interested was to great, see yeah. how you were going to turn that, both of these pieces of work, into one presentation, which yeah. you've done, yeah, it's very deaf. So, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, no, well. really, really good. And you presented really, really well. So, well, your action you. styles, both of you, were, were excellent. Yeah, uh, no, no problems on that score. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I need to score you for the university. <laughs> <laughs> See you later. We have a presentation yeah. tomorrow as well. What time oh, yeah. did you say you were about? Probably be, be back about half two. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I'll be downstairs yeah, anyway. So. Right. Right. Thank See you. Later. Cheers. Cheers. Nice stuff. So you got him later on in the day. That's good. Mm. Tony will be really good on our stairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, she's very nice. pleasant, creative, as well as doing the. Oh, that's all I do. Yeah. Together, so, um, and he's very uh, well versed in terms of the, you know, the leadership within the council. Yeah. And I mean, she used to be the leader's sort of right hand. So, mm. you know, she's got a very good take on it. And, I mean, the further up you sort of are, I imagine, when it comes to funding and budgets and that, the more you're going to be working. Well, she she's she's unusual in that she actually has a, a very good grasp of what's going on.